my mom is going to Baguio for a national women's convention this week. But before she leaves, she's going to give to us the word of God. Let's welcome. Yeah, Sister Knight. Okay, welcome everyone. Good morning. I understand we have some guests today, but I didn't have a chance to meet you at the welcome lounge because I just had, uh, had to rest a little bit for the um, second session. Uh, we would like to thank everyone who joined Heart Camp 2018, okay? Um, we didn't have all the time to tell stories of what happened, but uh, what I can really say is that the Lord really has helped us accomplish the goals that we had uh, uh, in our hearts uh, to accomplish in Heart Camp, through Heart Camp 2018. So thank you for joining us. Uh, I would love to say this to everyone who didn't have a chance or the opportunity to join us this time. Probably your schedule did not allow you. Uh, we understand there are still classes and everything else. But I would love you to know that whatever we have started in Heart Camp uh, gave us like a, a momentum through which we can start moving towards what God, we believe, as your pastors, is leading us to do as a church, okay? So I would love to remind our in charge of our venue, including our janitors, please, please don't take down the butterflies, okay? Remember, we made you understand the meaning of the butterfly, uh, why we use the butterfly as like an icon for our Heart Camp 2018. For our guest, Heart Camp is a, uh, an event that we had last week. We had uh, uh, more than almost 300 people joining us from all over the Philippines. And we had streams of training in different uh, uh, areas in the arts and also training for pastors. But we said that uh, we talk about the butterfly effect, okay? Where it says that uh, big things can come out of little things. That the little change in the atmosphere, for example, that can be started by the flapping of a tiny butterfly, the flapping of the wings of a tiny butterfly could be the beginning of many things that would eventually lead to a huge storm or a hurricane. So it's like that. And we had been saying in our stream with the pastors that the little changes and the commitments to change that we are making okay, could be the beginning of big things that God can do that will change our church, will change our families, will change our city, and will change the nation or even change the world. And so that's what has happened in the past uh, few days during hard camp. We have made commitments to make changes so that, you know, God can better use us in our days to reach the today's world. And uh, please don't feel uh, left out. Uh, after hard camp, we will be continuing sharing with you what God has started. And so you join us because we believe we are entering great days in the work of God for the church. Is that okay to everybody? Okay, everyone at the back. So we are all in this together. So this morning, I would like to continue my stream. Pastor Ray and I had a stream for pastors and leaders, and it is called Urbanidad, where we are training pastors and leaders how that we can be effective uh, in the ministry in a setting, the urban setting. So we will continue that. I would like to pick that up today. If you would like to op uh, start and open your Bibles with me in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. And Proverbs 11, 11. Please stand with me, please, as we read the text. Again, I would like to say welcome to our friends and guests who are here for the first time. Okay. If I may say what has been... A dominant truth that we have been trying to share during heart camp at Urbanidad is the fact that we have to change our focus 
from the inside to the outside. There have been so much focus on what is inside the church. And we had been challenged to begin to look outside. And this is our key verse, Matthew 5, 14. You read with me? You are the light of the world. And a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Proverbs 11, 11. By the blessing of the influence of the upright and God's favor because of them, this is the amplified version, the city is exalted, but it is overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. Let us pray. Father in heaven, I pray that we all will have a mind that is ready to receive your truth and a heart that is soft to your leading and to your voice so that we can make the necessary alignments or realignments of our hearts, O oh God, to your word today. Speak to us in a very personal way, individually and corporately as a church with a destiny in the city of Rojas. So we thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so on the screen, the title of my message, guess what it is. You read. Huh? Love Rojas City. Okay, that's not a person. That's the city of Rojas. I'd love to challenge you today as people who live in Rojas City that we will love Rojas City as we have never loved it before. Is that okay? Who are you from Rojas City? Raise your hands. Yes. You love Rojas City? Now some of you are probably living in another town, but you are here in Rojas City and so love Rojas City as well with us. Are there people here who are not from Roja City? Raise your hands, including me. I'm from Iloilo. Are there people here who are transferring to Roja City? Okay, I'll be challenging you to really make Roja City your home, okay? So, but all together, you know, we are here at this season in our lives, all living in Roja City. And I would love to challenge you this morning that we will love Roja City. Okay, let's start. You know, uh, today, if uh, you are very active, you know, looking into the internet on YouTube and you try to listen to sermons, you will really come up with a lot of teachings, on video or even books that would somehow tell us that God hates the city. You know, throughout the week, uh, we had been discussing with uh, Brian, our uh, youth director, and also with my sons and Pastor Wayne and myself, that there are a lot of teachings saying that God hates the city, you know, with all the violence and all the immorality and the wickedness that people observe in the city. And there is that campaign that is as if you know, God hates the city and that the Bible is advocating and against the city theology. Okay? When, you know, when we read of all those evil things happening in the city, and if you are not careful, you know, you can also pick up the attitude of hating the city. You know, you begin to say, oh, what is happening in the city, you know? Oh, there is so much violence, there is so much drug addiction, there is so much immorality. You know, the city is dirty and as if the city, you know, is the breeding place of all kinds of wickedness and immorality and violence. But is that what really the Bible teaching? Does God hate the city? Hello, city folks. There is that wrong understanding about the city. And the, most of these teachers, uh, 
advocating hatred for the city, that God hates the city, that, you know, it's not good to be in the city. Their support uh, are from two accounts in the Bible. Especially in Genesis chapter 4, they would refer to the line of Cain. Do you remember Cain? You know, Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain and Abel. And Abel killed his brother, I mean, Cain, I'm sorry. Cain killed his brother, Abel. And from the line of Cain, if you read in Genesis chapter 4, you know, it's from his line that the first city builder we would see there. So the first city builder was from the line of Cain and also all other people who progressed, you know, the people who did uh, uh, all kinds of forms of industry. And at the same time, you know, uh, they had the musicians there. And down the line, in the line of Cain, we hear there of people who had several wives, they did violence, they had all those things. And so they say, you know, it started there. The city is the product of people from the line of Cain, and it became a breeding place of violence and all immorality. And then we have the second account in the book, in the Bible, you know, after the line of Cain, and also God gave birth. Uh, I mean, Adam and Eve, you know, was given another son, Seth, and from the line of Seth came, you know, the godly line that called upon the Lord. But then after a while, there was a, an intermarriage between the godly and the ungodly line. And then when you read in chapter 6 of Genesis, it says there, you know, wickedness was so much on the face of the earth, and every inclination of the thoughts and hearts of men on earth was towards wickedness only. And then, therefore, God judged the world with a flood. You remember your Bible? And after the flood, you know, starting with Noah and Noah's three sons, Ham, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, then we read again another civilization, the line of Ham. And it is through the line of Ham that the next city builders came. If you read your Bible, we had Nimrod, okay? And the first cities they built, okay, were like, you know, the cities of Babylon in the plains of Shinar. They were city builders. And then you read about the account of the Tower of Babel where people began to exalt themselves against God. And they said, oh, we're going to build a tower that is going to reach heaven. And, you know, this is a, a, a people who said, we will group together. We will, not divide, we will not scatter as God said. And we will build a tower that will reach heaven. And you know, we will make ourselves famous. And that sounds like the culture of the city, you know, about being number one, being famous, you know, defying God of the heavens. It's like everything depended not on God, but depended on what men can do. That sounds like the culture of the city. And your teachers would say, you see, God hated the city and God came down to judge them. They confused their languages and they all scattered. And that's what they say. God hates cities. But you know, if you look into the Word of God again, you know, the best way to get the right teaching is, you know, to go and start from the very beginning. And all these capacities of man and the genius and creativity of man, did, all these did not come, you know, from city builders. All of this came from God. Understand me? When God created man, I said, God created man in his image. And God gave this man that he created with intellect and creativity. And God said to this man that he created, you know, you come and subdue the earth. Man was created with so much potential. And if man had not fallen into sin, you know, we could have expressed that godly given, that divinely given talents and creativity. We could have expressed that in all kinds of beautiful forms, in music, in technology, in the arts. Do you understand me? The ingenuity and the creativity of man did not come from the city. But because, you know, man has fallen into sin, okay, there had been so much wicked manifestations of the God-given talents. But hey, in heart come, we would say we would love to redeem all of these because nothing started with the devil. Everything came from God. 
And then you read later on in the life of Abraham and God started to call Abraham because God was working out his redemption plan. You know, he looks upon the face of the earth and people were grouped as nations. And God said, I will build my own nation. And he called Abraham. And listen to this. When he called Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, this is one of the things that he said to Abraham. He said, I will make you into a great nation. God was working out his redemption plan through this man, Abraham. And God's strategy was from Abraham, God will build a nation. And so Abraham got Isaac and Jacob. And Jacob became the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. And the nation that God was saying to Abraham was the nation of Israel. And guess what? The capital of the nation of Israel is the city of Jerusalem. God wanted to have a nation of his own. And God wanted to have a city of his own which will become the center of the worship of the one true God. So now if sinful generations and sinful civilization would make the cities as their center of violence and immorality. Listen to me, my brothers and sisters. God's plan is that a city could be a center and a monument of God's love and God's favor and God's blessing if the people in the city, you know, will worship God and speak about God, spread the love of God. And so you begin to imagine with me, how would you love it that Roha City will not be a den of thieves, will not be a den of drunkards and, and drug addicts, but Roha City will be a monument to the worship of the one true God. Because of you and me. And hey, do you know that God is preparing a city for us? Hello? He's preparing the new Jerusalem. And when I begin to think about that, you know, oh, I am going to be a city dweller in eternity. You are city fox. God did not say, I'm going to prepare a barangay for you. He said, I'm going to prepare a city for you. And in that city, this God will be worshipped. Hallelujah. In that city, the glory of God will fill the city. Hallelujah. It will be to the glory of God. So God doesn't hate cities. God loves cities. God loves the people in the city. That's why today, I would really challenge you. You know, I am not from Roja City. I had my share of frustrations while living in Roja City. And I think I mentioned that to you, or probably in my session in Urbanidad. And I have to be honest, there was a time when I felt bad about living in Roja City, living in Roja City, and I thought I should go home. Because that's how it is. But if you know where God has placed you, that's why I would love to invite everyone. If you are a Roja City resident, stay in Roja City. Those of you who are just transferring to Roja City, stay in Roja City. And let us work together, you know, for the glory of God in the city of Rojas. Oh, come on. Can I have an amen from this congregation? So that is the wrong conclusion about the city. But you see, nonetheless, we, we read in the Bible that there are instances where God judged cities. So why did God destroy cities? If you look into the Bible account, God destroyed cities when the sin of the people has come to its full measure. When the degree of the wickedness of cities or even entire nations merits the judgment of this holy God. You know, God we say is a God of love, 
He is long-suffering towards men. He is not willing that anyone should perish, but that everyone would come to repentance. But nonetheless, He is a holy and a just God. And after giving so much time for people to repent and for cities to repent, you know, so that they will recognize that He is the only one true God, and they refuse to do so, we call that in the Bible that their sin has come to its full measure. We say that in our saying, in our dialect, na kung, kung puno na ang gantangan, kalison. Okay? And that's why there are instances in the Bible where God destroyed cities. And one example of that is Sodom and Gomorrah. Early in the narrative of the Bible, as early as Genesis Chapter 13, it says there, the men of Sodom were wicked exceedingly and they were sinners against the Lord. They were wicked exceedingly. You know, that is just a few chapters from the chapter on the beginning of the world in Genesis 1. Genesis 13, it already says there, after Adam and Eve fell into sin, Cain, and all down the generations, several generations from Adam, you know, sin has progressed already so much in the land of Canaan that the Bible says the people in Canaan, especially the people in Sodom and Gomorrah, have sinned exceedingly against the Lord. And so we read the account in the book of Genesis, very early in the Bible, how God brought fire and brimstone to judge the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. We also read about the account in the Bible about Canaan. You know, Canaan, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah is also part right there in Canaan. But, you know, generations after, when God called Abraham, God's plan was this, that he would build the nation of Israel and he said to Abraham, actually, he revealed his plan to Abraham in Genesis chapter 16. This is what he said, Genesis 16, 13. The Lord said to him, know for certain that for 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation, they serve as slaves, and afterwards they will come out with great possession. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and buried at the good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here. Because he said this to Abraham while Abraham was in Canaan. Your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached in full measure. Now you bear with me. When God called Abraham from, from Ur of Chaldees, God brought him down to Canaan. And God said to Abraham, to your descendants, I will give this land. But during that time, the land was full of the Canaanites. And so God said, Abraham, after the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here. And during that time, the sin of the people in the land will have reached the full measure and if you read the story, you know, in the history of Israel, when God was ready to bring the nation of Israel into the promised land, God said to them, kill all the inhabitants. Kill everything that has breath on it, including the animals. You know, they say in Canaan during that time, even men would have sex with animals. The sin was so great. And God wanted to clean up the land from all those immorality and wickedness. And so when the sin of Amorites have come to the full measure, that is the time when Israel was ready to be used by God to punish the people of Canaan. Because by that time, the sin of the Canaanites have come to the full measure. That is why some people are asking, how could God, a holy and a loving God, command his own people to kill a people. Well, it is not because God is not anymore a God of love, but rather because the sin of the Canaanites had come to its full measure. And God was just using the people of Israel to punish the sin of the land. Are you with me? So if ever God is destroying cities, 
It is because sin has to be judged. When sin has come to such degree that God will have to punish that sin, that is the justice of God. Now let me ask you at this point. Would you, would you love that if sometimes we see sin and immorality in your neighborhood and drugs and everything in the city? Would you love that someday the city of Rojas would come to a point that the sin of the people of the city of Rojas would come to its full measure that God would judge the city? You're not answering me. Would you love that to happen? No. That is why we are here. Yes? That is why Destiny City Church is here. Of course, there are other churches in the city, but I cannot speak to them whether they have discerned this truth or not. You know, one truth that disturbed me while I was preparing my notes for Urbanidad, but I didn't, hand, I didn't yet touch that in my sessions because I read, you know, the truth that whenever God is ready to judge a city, he first takes away his own people. That is why when he was about to judge Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, God has to send people to, to Lot and his family. Leave! Leave the city! Save yourself! And I read an article which says that, you know, when a city is so wicked, and if the church in that city is not doing its job, to influence the city with the love and the holiness of God. You know, God is going to judge the city and that church will be closed down because they are not doing their job. So would you love the city to be judged? Your answer is no. Would you love Destiny City Church be closed down by God? No. If we don't do our job. God loves the city. He only judges the city when the sin of the city has come to its full measure. And so we see here, brothers and sisters, that God has given the church in the city a role to play, you know, in the welfare of the city. We have a role. There is a reason why we are here in Roja City. There is a reason why you are brought down here in Roja City. It's either that through us, a city will be spared, or if through our failure, a city will be destroyed. That's how strategic and important the church is in the city. Am I very serious this morning and you are very quiet? The role of the city in the church. Biblical record shows that a city can be spared or not through the intervention and through the influence of God's people. Let's go back to Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, before God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, God visited Abraham. You know, this is what God said. You know, God said, you know, in verse 17 of Genesis chapter 13, God said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? You know, Abraham at the time was living in Canaan, and his nephew Lot that separated from him, you know, lived in Sodom and Gomorrah. I know God that day visited Anna, uh, what do you call this, Abraham, because Abraham... Uh, God was giving the news to Abraham that Sarah, that they're going to have a child. But then it was also a time when God is ready to judge Sodom and Gomorrah. But here is the key. God said, should I hide from Abraham what I plan to do? What do you see here? Hey, church, God reveals his plan to his people. And God's people who can discern the ways of God, we can discern what God is planning for our city. Are you understanding me? 
And so God revealed to Abraham, you know, that he plans to judge Sodom and Gomorrah. If you are in the case of Abraham, what will you do? And so you hear Abraham here. He started to plead. He started to intercede for Sodom and Gomorrah. Let's look into that. This is the argument. In verse 22, Abraham remained standing before the Lord, and he approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Then Abraham, what, what if, if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? And this is God's answer in verse 25. Far be it from you to do such thing. Uh, Abraham said, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will you not judge of all the earth do right? Wow. And this is what God said. If, if I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. What do you see here? You know, God gave Abraham the chance to be involved in what he will finally do with the city. And this is our role. You know, if we begin to sense, you know, a, an impending judgment in our city, because we know that God is a holy God. You know, we can begin to kneel down before the Lord and say, God, look, your church is here. There are people here who worship you. Will you destroy the righteous with the wicked? Even just 50 people, Lord. And God said, okay, I'm a just God. If. I find 50, I will spare the city for the sake of the 50. That's in it. The word of God says that the church, the people of God, is the salt of the earth. You know, it's because of us that a city is preserved. Hey, you should start feeling good about yourself. You know, sometimes if you're the only born-again believer in your family, your family look down on you, right? Your neighbors look down on you and, oh, these people, born again people, hallelujah people, and they ridicule you and you feel bad because, you know, oh, yeah. But hey, rise up, church. It is because of righteous people in the city that even if the city is so wicked, God is sparing the entire city for the sake of a few righteous people. That's why we are here. And so, but probably Abraham started to think, uh-oh, let wait a minute. I don't think there is 50 there. So he went down to 40 and said, Good, okay, if there are 40. Went further down to 30. If there is 30, God said. And then down to 20, God said, okay, if you find 20, okay. How about 10, Lord? Okay, God said, okay, if you find 10. 10, I will spare the city. And Abraham stopped. Was the city destroyed? Yes. Why? Because there were not even 10. Well, oh, Abraham stopped. Probably he thought, well, we have Lot and his wife and, and his three daughters and their husbands. That's six, that's two, that's eight. Well, probably he thought, oh, probably they, they have two converts there. But there was not even, a, his wife even was not that, uh, that, his wife turned to Sodom when it was being judged by the Lord and was turned into a pillar of salt. And his, ch his children later on, 
You know, his children, because, you know, his children laid down with Lot and they committed incest. They had been marred by the culture of sodomy in Sodom and Gomorrah. There was not 10 righteous people. But what do you think? What do you think if Abraham persevered and said, God, how about, how about five? Would God say yes? And what if he persevered, God, what about two? Do you know that there was a time when the whole world was wicked and every inclination of the thoughts of hearts of men were towards wickedness, but there was only one man, that is Noah. You know, I would love to think, I wish, you know, that Abraham could have persevered. And let me encourage you today, brothers and sisters, let us not easily give up on our city or on anyone we see is living in sin. Let us not easily give up. Let's continue to plead God for His mercy to spare the city, to spare a barangay, to spare your community. Because God is a God of mercy. But think about that. God involved Abraham. And God wants to involve us with whatever he plans to do in our city. You like that? Let us have that kind of, of awareness about our city. Now, there's another city. Unlike Sodom and Gomorrah, it was it was spared. The city of, read your Bible. City of, city of Nineveh. Jonah chapter one, verse says here the. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the son of Amittai, saying, "Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil." has come up before me. God also was ready to judge this great city of Nineveh. But before he did that, here is this wonderful God again. He, there was nobody in Nineveh, you know, to influence the city. So he called this prophet Jonah. And of course, we read the story about this prophet, the hesitant prophet so instead of, you know, took a boat going to Nineveh, he took a boat going to a different direction. But you know, God, you know, you see, God is insistent that the people of Nineveh will first have a chance, right? He's giving a city a chance to repent. And so he had to deal with this disobedient person, his his prophet Jonah, and Jonah ended up, you know, in the, in, the, in the belly of a big fish. And you know the story, and so Jonah had to say, okay, Lord, so will I. I could remember him singing, I probably say, so will I. <laughs> say, singing a song of surrender in the belly of the whale. And so we read here Jonah later on going back to Nineveh, and this is what he said. When he started to preach, you know, in chapter 3 of verse 4, Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out. This is not a very good, very, very, very inspiring preaching, but it was, he was a preacher of doom. And he said, 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. <coughs> I could imagine Jonah, you know, preaching with, he was not happy that he's preaching there actually, but he just obeyed. But nonetheless, God used that for the people of Nineveh to respond. And good, the record says, and the people of Nineveh, verse 5, believed God. 
And they called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. And the word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink from and turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in this land. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. And sure it did. Verse 10, God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, and God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them. And he did not do it. A city, you know, that is worthy, that merits the judgment of God. But for the ministry of the prophet of God, calling them to repentance, the whole city, entire city from the king to the slave, they turned from their wicked ways and asked God to, to uh, spare them. And this loving God, spare them. We have that role, brothers and sisters, in the city. Now, how about our time now? How do you evaluate the city of Rojas? Come on, start talking. What do you think of the city of Rojas? Is the city of Rojas ripe for judgment? We don't want to think that way, right? Or probably we really have not thought about it. Right? We would love to work in a way that our city you know, we'll be a city for God. Can I hear an amen? You know, I'm not from the city. We came here in 1978. And during the time, the city of Rojas is listed among the top 10 cities that is most difficult to penetrate with the gospel. Some of you who are in Rojas City may not be aware of that. But we who were in Bible school and we are studying, you know, where to go. Raw City is among the top 10 cities in the Philippines that is hardest to penetrate with the gospel. Anybody who is here, born here, still remember? Of course, my grandsons are born here. I remember during the time Dr. Protashu was an idolatrous woman, yes. <laughs> Sorry for saying that. Yeah. We came here, brothers and sisters. There was so much hold of idolatry. I'm sorry if you have guests here. I'm not trying to put down the city of Rojas. But that's what it, it is. This is one of the hardest cities to penetrate with the gospel of Jesus. The biblical gospel of Jesus. People are religious but they are not worshiping the one true God. We used to be stoned here when we start practicing. But how about now? Are things, has things changed? Huh? The only evangelical church here when we first came in 1978 was Capi's Evangelical Church. So it's like our situation now is like what is described actually in Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 27. This is Pastor Ray's text actually in Urbanidad. His topic on how to thrive 
in Babylon. You know, the setting of the people of God, Israelites, during this time, the people of Israel, they were not living in Jerusalem. They were not living in their city. But back then, they were living in the city, you know, where the temple is there, and they would worship God according to the Jewish practices as instituted by God. And they gave worship to the one true God. But you know, they backslid and they turned to the worship of idols. And so God had to discipline them. And God had allowed, allowed, I mean, for other countries, you know, to, to conquer them. First by Assyria and then by Babylon. And the setting of the ministry of the prophet Jeremiah is when the people of Israel were exiles. They were captives of Babylon and they were exiled in Babylon. They were pulled out from their city, Jerusalem, from their land, Israel, and they were brought as exiles, as slaves in a land that is called Babylon. Babylon during that time was the seat of idolatry, the seat of all the wickedness that goes with the worship of idols. And when you read Jeremiah 29, you know, we always read this verse and we read like, you pray for the welfare of the city. You know, probably you were thinking, oh, Israel was asked to pray for the welfare of the city of Jerusalem. No, it, they were in Babylon. And they were there when God told them, pray for the welfare of the city. And the city there that God was talking about is not Jerusalem, but rather Babylon. Now, do you know that that is our situation now? We are in Babylon. Because we, this is not our home place. Are you residents really of the city? Yes, we are. But spiritually speaking, this is not our dwelling place, our permanent address. Amen? We are citizens of heaven. And we are aliens in this world. And in this world, we see so much idolatry and sin and corruption and violence. Just that we are living locally in this portion of the earth called Rojas City. We are in our own Babylon people of God, citizens of heaven. Hallelujah. And whatever we learn from what God is saying to the people of Israel when they were in Babylon could also be what God is saying to us, God's people who lives actually in heaven, but we are still on this earth. So let's look into what God is saying to the people of Israel. You know, there were prophets during that time saying that, you know, uh, it will be only two years and God will restore you to the land. But God said, no, they are not true prophets. They are false prophets. And so these false prophets were teaching the people of Israel while they were in Babylon wrong things and teaching them wrong things to do. Do not submit to Babylon. Do not submit to the king of Babylon. But this is what God said in in Zechariah chapter 27, verse 4, God said, Give them this charge for their masters. Jeremiah said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, This is what you shall say to your masters. It is I who by my power and my outstretched arm have made the earth with the men and animals that are on the earth, and I give it to whomever it seems right to me. Now I have given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servants, and I have given him the beast of the field to serve him. All the nations shall serve him and his son and grandson until the time of his own land comes. Then many nations and great kings shall make him their slave. God said, you are in Babylon. You are supposed to submit 
to the king in Babylon because it is I who owns everything who determines to whom I will give. And I am the one who raised Nebuchadnezzar. To him I have given this land in this season. And he said, all of you should submit to Nebuchadnezzar. Now you think about this. You put this in your own situation, you know. Oh, I'm a Christian. And my boss is not a Christian. Should I obey him? Should we, should we always be the one leading a rally there if we see anything wrong being done by our city government? Come on, let's rally against the city government. Should that be we doing? And we always, you know, behave in a way that, you know, we are morally superior than the people in the city because we are God's people. And, you know, we become the most rebellious people everywhere we are. You're the most rebellious employee, the most rebellious teacher, the most rebellious young people. Because we are not submitting to the government rules because, you know, this is not our world. We are citizens of heaven. But that is not what God is saying. Do you follow me? This is what God said. You read. Then the, says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Verse 5, what he said, build homes and live in them. Anybody has homes here in Roja City? Can you raise your hand? Good. Have you built homes here? Rent a home? And then he said, plant gardens. <laughs> and eat the produce. And then he said, take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Oh, build your homes, plant a garden, stay here, marry here, marry somebody from Roja City. Are there enough beautiful ladies and handsome men in Ross City? Single ladies, you don't have to look outside. Marry somebody from here. <laughs> and give your children, you know, bear children and bear grandchildren in Rojas City. That's what God is saying. And then he said further on, that you may bear sons and daughters, multiply here, there, and do not decrease but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for it is for in its welfare you will find your welfare now these are the five things that God is telling us I told you let us love the city and these are the five things we can learn that God is telling us what to do if you are in our Babylon, first he said, live in the, city, in the city. Let's get settled here. As I was saying, I know there are some people who are just transferring to Ross City. Perhaps you can start praying. No, I think I should start building my home. We invite you to live in Roja City. I had been, uh, and it says here, thrive in the city multiply do not decrease you thrive set up businesses here set up the best school the best business the best coffee shop hallelujah let us thrive in the city invest in the city i, I had i i have met at least two people one a few couple of years ago and they were, I will not mention the business, but they have started to invest here. They are not from here. They are Tagalog speaking. And I said, how is it? How do you find starting a business here? And she said, it's very difficult. She says, it's like, it's like the people here are, are not yet ready for you know, new things. 
But he said, it's okay. I said, I'm, I'm going to fight it through. Just a couple of weeks before hard camp started, I again met somebody, a very young lady, very intelligent. And they're not from here, but they're pioneering a great work in Ross City. And I was so blessed when she said, I asked her again the same question. I said, how do you find it here starting something in Roja City? Because I said, I sense that what you're doing is like you are pioneering something in Roja City. And she said, yeah, it's difficult. She said, it's difficult. But he said, you know, this is the dream of my husband. And I joined the dream of my husband. And he said, I'm even amazed that even my children encourage us. Do it, mom. Do it, dad. Do it here in Roja City. And as I was listening to her, I said, you know, that's how I felt when we first started here in Roja City. You know, my parents, my relatives, my friends who knew me. Well, you know, modesty aside, you know, Pastor Ray is an activist. And it's very intellectual. You know, I'm a UP, I'm a UP student and my mind is very radical. And I speak English a lot. And I come here. It's very hard to speak English here before. And then my friends would say, why Roja City? You should have gone to other places. And so we were talking that, that way. I said, wow. I said, I think we have something in common. And so we immediately became real good friends. And she said, yeah. I said, we should talk some more. And I said, yes, we will talk some more. Because she said, you know, ah, me and my husband, we would love to give back to the community of Roja City. And she said, you know, uh, uh, you know we saw something here. There is something here. Hello, Ross City people. And I take that as God's words for the city. Something good is cooking for the city. The reason why more and more people are coming in, in fact, today there are some people here that I know that have sat with I told you almost every Sunday we would sit down with a visitor, a couple of visitors, and getting to know them. And they have just moved in to the city of Rojas. You know, when I was new here, I would talk to people who are really from Rojas City. And you know what they would say before? They would say, there's nothing here. I remember our very own dear friend, Sister Mighty Koro. She said, there's nothing here. And other friends and other members of the church who were with us in the beginning here, there's nothing here, you know. Business people, they don't invest here. There's nothing here, okay. Your, your children, they try to find jobs outside of Rossi. There's nothing here. Really, when we first came here, the light here, the electricity was low voltage. The water is, was salty. There was nothing here. I asked my daughter-in-law, who, uh, who is a manager of Starbucks in SM Iloilo, I said, Belle, can you, because I, she said, we are opening 200 more new Starbucks stores all over the Philippines. And so I said, would you open one in Ross? And she, they sure, she sure sent someone to check on Roja City. They checked on Robinson, and the report was, it's not time yet. They are opening two more in Calibo, but nothing in Roja City yet. But that's Starbucks. But other people are coming in. Hello. People are beginning to invest in Roja City because, as I have said, there is a sense of anticipation that something is here in Rojas City. Hello, there is something here. Why would God start to bring people in Rojas City? I see my dear friend Bells there who has worked so hard with the Echo Parks and everything, which is gathering a lot of, of visitors. And you know, I attended my Berean, uh, my alumni, our alumni gathering with my classmates in UP. And it, to my amazement, they said, Nights, we want to go to Ross City. 
We want to have our reunion in Roha City. I was about to say, why of all places Roha City? So I didn't suggest it to them. They saw something here. Hello? So God is saying, you know, to the people of Israel, thrive in the city. In time, my dear brothers and sisters, especially people from Roha City, in time, we look at the dream cream, hallelujah. You start businesses that would be, that would increase, give name and bless the city. That is what we are supposed to do. You know, when we first came here and I started to be pregnant, you know, I'm from Iluilu and my family eats a lot outside. Well, I was looking and craving for some food. Number one, we didn't have money to buy. We only have 40 pesos a week here before. Secondly, if ever I have money to buy, there, are no, there were no restaurants here. There were no malls. The only restaurant here during my time, 1979, 1980, was Arthur's La Paz Batchoy. And you know, La Paz Bat Batchoy is not good for somebody who is throwing up a lot. So in the evening, I would grab my cookbooks. I have a lot of cookbooks. I would open up the pages and look at the pictures. And I would cry. And I'm so embarrassed, I would try to hide my face from Pastor Ray. And Pastor Ray said, what are you crying about? But actually, I was crying because I want to eat the food in the picture. There was nothing here then. But there was something here. The small church. The First Assembly, Rojas Missions. A few people started to pray for the city. We started to conduct Bible studies in the city. And the church has grown to be the destiny city church. And hey, folks, as we continue to dwell in the city and thrive in the city and invest in the city and pray for the welfare of the city, could you imagine with me someday this city will rise up? This city that was number 10 as a very idolatrous city, it seems that they are dedicating the city to idols. Could you believe me that this can be a city that could be a monument to the worship of the one true God? And this city will pray. Prosper because God prospers a place where his people are. That's why I'm asking you, let us love the city. You know, my message is being recorded, I think. This will be on Facebook. I would love to say this to the people of Roja City. Invest in the city. If there are business people here, put your investments here. I love what that lady that I talked to, she said, yes, Mrs. Calusa, it's difficult. People in Ross City are not yet into what we are doing yet, but it's coming because somehow somebody has to start. Amen? Somehow. For me, this was like kind of a a forgotten city but you know we have we have destiny city church was then known as Assem first assembly Rojas missions farm we already have started we have the track record actually of blessing the city you know what is the city of Rojas known for is there anything good that you can say about Ross City as of now? Come on, say something good about Rojas. You see, it's fine, it's hard. But there was something really bad that they say about Ross City before. Yeah. Mga aswang. That's why they say, you know, products from Raw City are not sold as products from Raw City. The, the fish, the milk fish, 
from Ross City is not sold as products of Ross City because people will not buy if it is from Ross City, if it is from Capis, because we are Aswang. We have a history. Now you Google about Aswang Festival. Check it out in the internet. Perhaps some of you do not know this, but it is on record. It is in the history of Roja City. It is the first assembly who stopped that. Come on. It was a time when several very intelligent and influential young professionals wanted you know, to start and make Ross City popular through what they called the Aswang Festival. And we fought for that. I personally fought for that. And the results of those are in the minutes of our city government. I know Macy knows that. We fought for that. For a while, I was very popular in the city because every camera was on me when I spoke about that at, uh, in front of the Sangguni Ang Panglongsod. I know there was, there was that decision not to pursue with the Aswang Festival. And I talked to these you know, very intelligent young professionals, and they are now still my friends. I said, you are young, you are influential, you have the resources. Why don't you think of projects, you know, to lift the city of Rojas and to give Rojas City a positive image instead of a very negative image as the then of Aswangs? We have to speak out. Lately, they wanted to revive that. Thank God for our heart camp, and we have artists in our, in our community in Destiny. And you know, Maru, who is the artist of the city, we fed him with that information. And you said, don't allow them. They were supposed to have the last festival we had. Every province is supposed to have, in, to be parading as their icon. You know, the witchcraft symbols, the thick balang and the mang, and the, what is that, that is... Mananangal and the, all of that and they're gonna parade it again on the streets but I said we told Maro no you speak out because you see God has given us the influence you know whoever was planning there said everything that you're gonna do should pass through Maro a lion first and Maro said instead of having the tikbalang and the mananangal let us have the seafood icons and so instead of that what has been paraded on the streets were the lukun the lobsters and the crabs because that's what we are we are the seafood's capital of the philippines and people are coming here very good things are happening in the city of rojas brothers and sisters we live in the city we thrive in the city amen we dwell in the city we increase in the city hallelujah Wherever you are positioned by the Lord, in whatever domain of society, if you're a teacher, you be the best teacher in your school for the glory of God. If you are in the arts, you know, the dancers and business people, or you start up a coffee shop, you start up whatever business you are, hallelujah, you are doing it all, you know, because you are investing in the city, you are thriving in the city, you are working for the city to prosper, and in all of that, you glorify God. God's eyes in heaven is looking down upon the city of Rojas. And don't be afraid. We are in a city. What if violence will come? That is why we are here. So it says here again, we seek for the welfare of the city. Let us be engaged and involved in the city. I was telling you that after hard camp, there will be a lot of things that we will be doing. One of those things is for us to be involved in the different communities in the city, the marginalized communities in the city. You know, I look again into the possibility, you know, that we minister to the people outside. Are you beginning to imagine things with me? And my challenge is, have a part in this. 
families, you sit down and talk. How can we be a part of this? We live in the city. We will prosper in the city. How can we be involved in the city and work for the welfare of the city? Hey, church, we're not just here to go to church, you know, and sit down every Sunday and go home and forget about our assignment. We are here in the city for a purpose. We, the Bible says, is the light of the world. Pray for the city. Proverbs 11, 11, let me read that verse again, says, Through the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted. But by the mouth of the wicked, it is destroyed. We better stop cursing the city. We better stop saying bad things about the city. I have to be honest, I had my own share. Probably many of you have said sometime in the past, We don't we see some things that are not so good. But you know, God is redeeming the city. Whew. We better start. You know, it says there, by the mouth of the wicked. But if we begin to speak out well, to speak well of the city. Hallelujah. And you go out, be proud of the city. Amen. We are not from a city of Aswang. You know, we love the city. We are in the center of the Philippines. You know, at least in the Christian community, at least in the Assemblies of God community, do you know that this is like the center for everyone among us in the Assemblies of God? It's like the dream of everyone to go to Roja City, to go to Destiny City Church because we have modeled here hospitality and church planting and worship. And last week, this became the center again through hard camp. And uh, after hard camp was over, everyone is asking, will there be a hard camp 2019? And I think they were ready to register for 2019, you know. We are living in exciting days, brothers and sisters. And I am dreaming, you know, that this city indeed... You'll be so blessed by the Lord. And together, we will work to make this city a monument, you know, for this one true God. The backbone of idolatry is broken. But people live here and they come here to know the Lord. They come here to worship God. They would, you know, by the time, you know, that ride the airplane, when they get the touchdown, get off the airplane, that they would sense that there is something wonderful in the city of Rojas. And that something wonderful is the God of the people of Rojas City. And God's people. So stop cursing the city. Let us begin to think wonderful about our city in other words, I'm just saying to you, let us love the city of Ross. Are you cool with this? Who wants to do this starting today as we have never before? Yes, we had some complaints while living in the city, but that's why we are here. Amen. And so, before we pray for the city, I have two specific challenges. One, if there's anyone here who had been thinking about moving out of the city, I ask you to think about that again. Or if there's some of you who are thinking about whether you're going to invest in the city, you know, I ask you to stop, think about that again in the light of what I have preached. Talk it out with your family. You know, I say, let's stay in the city. Amen? And two, my question is this, would you like to join in this? Love Rojas City Movement. Would you love? Amen? Let us all stand. I would like you to join together around a table. If you are there at the back, with, 
please join with someone. You circle around the table and we will start praying for the city. But before that, you know, if uh, you are here, you try if you can share first some specific request to your group in relation to the city. Say anything you know about the city, say in your street, in your community that needed to be prayed for. Or there are some of you, you say, I'm making a decision whether to stay here or not. You, know? you share that to your group so you can pray. Any prayer requests relevant to what I have shared, you share it, you pray about those requests, and then after that, we will close praying for the city of Rojas. Come on, let's start. Start sharing first, and then before that, you pray. After that, you pray. You pray loud. Speak the word of God. Speak your prayer. Hallelujah. Bless the city. Oh, Jesus. Bless the city of Rojas, Lord. Hallelujah. Let there be dreams born for the city, Lord. Jesus. Oh God, may things be born, give birth to things for the city, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. He blessed the city of Rojas, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, God, let this be the beginning of big things. Starts, Lord God, with a little flapping of a little butterfly. But whatever decisions and commitments being made, be the beginning of big things, Lord God, for our city. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I really trust that dreams, seeds for certain projects are being planted in your hearts today. Well, some of our Berean students who are not from the Ro city of Rojas, I think they are planning to find wives here. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Just lift your hands. Let us declare God's sovereignty in the city of Rojas. Let's dedicate the city to the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Praise the Lord. Sing it. My heart will sing no other name. Jesus, hallelujah. 
it only Jesus. in the name of Jesus. With that name comes blessing, oh God. And every good gift that comes from you, oh God, is only through the name of Jesus. So we bless the city of Rojas. Today, God, together as a family of believers in Destiny City Church, we make commitments to love the city of Rojas. We will live in the city, thrive in the city, work for the welfare of the city and pray for the city of Rojas. So we dedicate the city to you and everyone represented here, oh God, every family represented here is under your care and protection and anointing, Lord God, so that we can be a part of your great move in these last days in the city of Rojas. This is our prayer and thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>